thank you so much for joining us today on Yom HaShoah. I couldn't think of a better person to talk about Holocaust education in Britain than you, Scott, because you have taken so many people through March of the Living and changed their lives. So I would love to start by talking about your life. Uh, we grew up very similar age, similar school, similar place. We both ended up pretty much also in similar places in many ways, serving our community. How did you, what was your journey to March of the Living? How did you get interested in Holocaust education? Well, first of all, thank you, Laura. It's great to, uh, it's, it's great to, to be here. It's uh, in this difficult time, in this um, unprecedented time. It's good to see you, even if it's on this sort of, again, bizarre, uh, bizarre way, but, um, I'm truly honoured to be here, so thank you. Um, I, you know, I went to a school in northwest London, not too dissimilar to you, as you've mentioned, and I didn't really grow up with any Holocaust education, which is unlike you. Uh, I grew up in a very sort of um, traditional Jewish background, but not particularly observant. Um, and I was involved in the financial services industry. I, I joined um, a broking firm. Um, straight out of school and was very fortunate enough to have then uh, been sent to New York and worked in London. And in 1993, I found myself in Tokyo um, and was invited with my wife to commemorate the life of a Japanese diplomat at the JCC in Tokyo. It was a, a very transient Jewish community and it was, um, it was very, it, it really was something that you know when you live miles and miles away from home in a place which is considered the wilderness certainly from a jewish perspective you you do tend to migrate towards other jews and that's exactly what happened and in 1993 i was invited with my wife as i said to to this commemoration of a japanese diplomat by the name of chieni sugihara sugihara um, was a remarkable individual he had um, a fascinating life which I could I could spend hours talking about and I won't because obviously we would literally bore everybody else and that just wouldn't be fair but the, the reality is is that um, he saved Jews in the war and he had been sent uh, by the Japanese government in um, 1939 early 1940 to countless Lithuania um, and as the vice consulate uh, where my family's from that's right you're from Lithuania I knew that actually Kaunas. Um, and he, um, he was approached um, to issue transit visas to go through Japan, um, initially by two Dutch yeshiva boys, but uh, by the time he had um, requested, he actually requested um, to have these transit visas issued on three separate occasions. By the third time, there were now hundreds of refugees looking to escape um, out of Poland and out of Lithuania. And his wife, um, he had already passed away at this stage, his wife um, explained to the audience, which we sat in, um, in Japanese, uh, through a translator, that for humanitarian reasons, um, Sugihara, his wife, and their, um, their personal assistant, their aide, um, decided that they would issue these visas. And what we know for sure is that approximately three and a half thousand Jews were saved. Um, mm -hmm. heard numbers as high as six and a half thousand. We certainly know that three and a half thousand Jews were saved. Now, what was remarkable about this is he only had a very narrow window um, to issue these visas. Um, and during that period, they, um, if I'm right in saying, they had to issue them all by hand because uh, Japanese writing is uh, um, up and down. It's not the way we write or, or the mm -hmm. way. And so, um, everything was not stamped, it had to be written by hand. And he issued these visas, the three of them, against the wishes of the Japanese government. Uh, he um, ultimately lost his job after the war and um, he spoke fluent Russian. He went and lived for a little while in Russia and he, he then ended up going back to Japan. And in the 1970s, um, he was actually rec recognized as a hero as opposed to a villain by the Japanese government. Mm. Um, having done something which for the Japanese was very, very unusual. He went behind authority, the, yeah. the authorities back. This story 
And, you know, I, as I said, I could tell you much more about this story. For the Jews, they ended up in Japan, then they ended up in Shanghai, in a ghetto in Shanghai, which I'm sure many people are much more familiar with the story of the Shanghai ghetto. But this story for me was um, an eye-opener, uh, beyond an eye-opener. I sat in Tokyo listening to the story of a Japanese diplomat that had saved Jews. I grew up, my father and um, would tell me stories about how his cousin had been um, a British soldier and had died on the Burma Railway. And so my impression of the Japanese was a very different impression. Um, and this completely gave me a new uh, set of eyes, if you like. Uh, new mm. um, the story became a little bit more personal um, in the fact that uh, we used to go to uh, Shul every Shabbat in Tokyo. And um, it was a wonderful place. It was a um, very mixed community, as you can imagine, in a small community, everybody got on. And I sat next to this elderly gentleman and my entire conversation with him was, good morning, Joseph, Shabbat Shalom, how are you? And that was my conversation with this man. And he would smile and he would say Shabbat Shalom. And I remember very clearly um, about a year later, he passed away. And um, nobody really knew him. It was very sad. The rabbi was very new to the community and even some of the older people within the community, when I say older, they, they may have been young people, but they'd been there for a longer period of time. Um, they knew him as the old guy or Joseph who sat there or Joseph who would take a bread roll from uh, the little luncheon that would happen after Shabbat services and then go home. Nobody really knew him. It turns out that his name was Joseph Shimkin and he had um, not only uh, survived um, in Kaunas and been a recipient of one of Sugihara's visas, but also that he had um, learned how to forge the visas because, as I said, Sugihara, Sugihara only had a very narrow window yeah. um, of which to issue them. And he had learned how to issue these visas um, or, or forge them. And he also um, knew how to place um, Jews looking to escape into, into the right hands um, and help them um, because, as you can imagine, you know, and we see it, we see it time and time again in history. Um, and we certainly have seen it many times when we studied the Holocaust. Um, many people didn't necessarily believe what was actually happening around them, even though there were warning signs, even they, they, they couldn't believe it. And similarly, you know, people may well have turned around and said, well, I have a visa, but I'm not going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to Japan. How am I going to get there? I've got no money. I, and there were many reasons I've got an old mother or I've got little kids, you know, it's not going to happen or it'll be all right tomorrow. Mm. Of course, we understand that that was not the case. It's easy to say in hindsight, mm. but um, they, they made, you, you know, he helped them get out and, and he himself um, supposedly lost a wife and a, a son um, in Kaunas and got out literally on the last opportunity that he could. At the end of the war, he, um, decided that he never wanted to go back to Europe and he created a business and a life for himself, he married a Japanese lady. We didn't know this until after he passed away because it was actually his wife who told the story. Oh, gosh. To the rabbi who, who had to bury him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I only find the story out after he passed away. And yet I sat next to him most weeks and it made such a profound impact on me mm. that I wanted to learn more. I wanted to understand more. Uh, understand is an interesting concept because when yeah. you learn about the Holocaust, you realize, uh, as you know, Laura, I mean, it, it's, you know, the more you learn, the less you know. And you certainly, the less you understand, I think. That's right. I think you know more, but understanding, comprehending, but, something yeah. else. Correct. Absolutely correct. And so for me, um, this inspired me to want to learn more. And so I suppose my journey of getting involved in Holocaust education really started there. Um, mm. And it was my own journey. It was my own desire to learn. And the more I learned, um, the more I decided that other people needed to know. And clearly some people did and some people didn't. Um, and in 1995, I moved to Hong Kong. And I was in Hong Kong for 15 years. 
Wow. Um, and while there, I started to uh, be involved in the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And we uh, brought over survivors from Australia, um, which was the nearest point. Right. And there are a lot of survivors. I mean, a, it, Australia, by the way. It's a survivor way, community. It's a survivor community, exactly. I believe that it has the largest survivor community per capita outside of Israel. That's right. Yeah, Australia. Mm -hmm. And we were very lucky to have brought some wonderful people to speak. And the more I listened, the more I wanted to share and the more I wanted to have my own children learn some of those stories. They were still quite small at the time. Um, mm. and, and that's really how it started. And then I guess 2006, uh, one of the board members of the JCC, I was on the board, um, and uh, she said to me, um, oh, you know, I think we should go to Poland. I think we should take a group from Hong Kong to Poland. And I said, well, I think that's a fantastic idea. Mm -hmm. she, as a student, she was Canadian. As a student, I was, um, uh, I went on this journey called March of the Living. She said. She said to me. Right. And I, said, mm -hmm. well, I think that's very interesting. We should find out more about it. And I genuinely had no idea what it was. Of course, it had been going since 1988, but not in the UK. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that was really the first time I went. And, and just to, to, to sort of finish on that question, how did I get involved? I, we went with a survivor um, from Israel, uh, actually originally from Strasbourg, who was a remarkable individual. And um, as you know yourself, when you are in Poland with a survivor telling you this is where I was, yeah. a very different experience to anything you can experience within Holocaust education. Yes, I remember when I was on uh, the march uh, three years ago, two years ago, um, uh, the, the survivor who accompanied us on our bus stood in the barracks in uh, Birkenau and said, this is, this is exactly where we washed our face. These bunks, is where we had ten, three layers of people. This is where people's fluids came down. And he told us what it was like for him at a 16 year old there. There's nothing There's strong a, coming back to your comprehend and yeah. understanding thing. Yeah, I know exactly who you're referring to as well. Eric, yeah. Eric. he's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful individual. Um, and, and for me, going with uh, the individual was who, who we went with was Noah Klieger, who unfortunately mm. passed away last year, um, who had the most remarkable story. He was actually a boxer in Auschwitz. Um, there were Olympic champions in Auschwitz. You know, uh, boxers, footballers, everything. You know, and um, to be with him, I think if my story began with Sugihara, yeah, I think it was cemented with him in the fact that I really wanted other people and young people in particular to to know these stories and to understand what can happen um, when hate takes, you know, is allowed to to really grow. Yes, when hate is allowed to really grow. Out of yes, and I suppose that's the um, Yom Hashoah message for the future: is never to allow hate. To grow when we say never again that's what we mean not just about jews but in general a hundred percent i mean we we've coined a phrase this year unfortunately obviously we're not going but not for living international has coined a phrase this year um, based on never again because we have seen so many times since the holocaust how many other genocides have taken place um you know and, and we all know we don't know the stories we don't know some of the intricacies but we have heard the names we've heard rwanda we've heard cambodia we've heard mm -hmm. um hatred is hatred and we have a responsibility to to teach our own and to teach everybody that hatred is unacceptable it doesn't matter whether it's anti-semitism it doesn't matter whether it's islamophobia it doesn't matter whether it's bullying whether it's homophobia it does not matter hatred is unacceptable and so we've coined the phrase never means never yeah to anyone ever. Anyone. It's interesting what you're saying about those values because um, often people who have values like that who lead organizations and you're the chair and founder of March of the Living UK, 
um, inculcate those organizations or that experience with those values. And the March of the Living in different countries has different tones and different culture and different values. And for those people watching this who haven't been on March of the Living, I would say, please God, when we can do it next year, you should go. And one of the reasons is, A, first of all, I had grew up in a very big sort of Holocaust awareness space. My dad talked about it nonstop, many ways. Um, I'd been to Lithuania where my family uh, were murdered, uh, those who didn't get out. And I had sort of known, but it wasn't until I was there that I understood and comprehended. And Scott's, your values, Scott, the gentleness, the dedication, the thoroughness, and people getting on with each other inculcate March the Living, where you have people from all different types of Judaism in Britain, uh, all different backgrounds, absolutely united. And you're very tough on the um, messages that do not get misused. So you will not let people say, because the Holocaust happened, you've got to be more religious, you've got to be more Zionist. And that is a beautiful and unusual thing. So I want to thank you for that work on behalf of Anglo Jury. Thank you. Um, I want to ask, when you running Jewish organizations in Britain, what can we say? It's a mixed blessing. <laughs> what was it like trying to start March of the Living here? Well, I... I <laughs> <laughs> can we move rapidly on? I, um, I, I have to say that uh, I had an advantage and a disadvantage. And that advantage was um, I didn't know anybody and I didn't understand the politics. Yeah, that is an advantage in a way. It's also the disadvantage mm -hmm. because I didn't know where to go and, and who to try to help me. And um, it, it, was, it was difficult. And, and I, it, nothing to do with Anglo jury, nothing to do with Jews in this country. But I think English, some people might... Um, might take offense but it's not meant but you know english english way english manner is very much to start off with no mm. right and there's a lot of you know americans always start off with yes most of it they can't necessarily always achieve so i, I like to think that people meet in the middle somewhere you know english starts off with no and you have to push them a little bit americans start off with yes and you have to temp you know temper them back a little bit but um so I think starting off, a lot of people said no. A lot of people said why. You know, there are many organisations. Of course, there weren't many organisations. There were a couple of organisations that that are very good at what they do, and they go. Um, and you know, it's I'm, I'm talking obviously to Poland and and on Holocaust journeys. Um, you know, and there are some great educators at other organisations. But I really wanted to be much more across the entire community and i really mm -hmm. wanted to um, find a way that people went together and i think initially people were very hesitant um, some a little bit territorial but mostly just hesitant or cynical and i think that's it it took a little bit of um persuasion a little bit of just constant badgering and some expletives along the way and some frustrations along the way, but yes, yes. I mean, you've been to Poland with me, Laura, so, you know, you understand. Yeah, I learned loads. But, but, the, but the truth is, is that um, I, I think, I just believe very strongly and I took some good people along with me who helped spread the message and I had mm -hmm. one or two funders and one or two organizations that really, bought in early on as to what we were trying to do and what I wanted to try and achieve. And that was mm -hmm. to give an education and not only about the Holocaust, but about a thousand years of Jewish history, about life. Right. That's also different in your vision. It's not about death camps. It's about life, Jewish life. And then understanding the death camps and the mass murder in that context. I've always said, Laura, that you can't understand what was lost until you understand what was there before. Mm, mm. I know that people have used that and at, at other places, but I, I really believe that that's oh. very important. And I also have very much a strong belief, um, and again, you've seen this, a strong belief that the story doesn't end in 1945, that there is 
an ongoing story and there's Jewish life today and we can argue the style of it and we can argue the depths of it but there is people who live there who are Jewish and some who want to be Jewish and are searching for their own identity. Mm. We make those connections and that's really important. Yeah. And beyond that, the story is not just a Jewish story. It starts as a Jewish story, but it's not just a Jewish, it's a human story. It's about, it's about people, it's about all people. And one of the great achievements I think that we have done over the last couple of years is take interfaith groups. And, and I think that that has been a tremendously eye-opening experience, mm. not just for them, but for the Jewish participants going yeah. who understand that these people, that there's a human aspect to the bigger story. And mm. if we are to make ourselves much more humanist, if you like, for want of a better expression in the future, it's about respect for all people and for all of us. And it starts mm. within the Jewish community. It's intra, but it's inter as well. Mm. That's a very, it's, no, the, that vision is your curriculum. It's what you do. Um, so lastly, we are coming up, you know, this year's the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. We were meant to be there next week. Next week. Yeah. Uh, and, or though, in fact, when people are seeing this, it's now today. Uh, tomorrow, uh, March was meant to be. We, we would have been the march would have been today, and we would have been in Bergen Belsen tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things, of course, is the changing nature of Holocaust education, and you see it in the other wonderful Holocaust spaces, Holocaust Education Trust, Holocaust Memorial Day, and so on, where they're also having to grapple with the changing nature because also our survivors are dying. Uh, and one of the things that's so strong, it's not just you want a survivor to come and speak. They are amazing. They, have to, they come on the bus and even though you look after them beautifully, they, it's quite a physical uh, challenge, I think, coming with and so on. Uh, they are amazing. So as we come to this change over the next 10 years, what do you see for the future for March of the Living UK? Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think we all try to grapple with um, how we're going to deal with with this. It's it's one of those things we don't like to talk about too openly. We don't like to upset people and the rest of it. But we are all grappling with with this concept of what we will do. The one thing I will say is, however we do it, um, and whether it's you know virtually, whether it's recording, there's lots of different discussions. One thing I will say is that when there are no survivors to tell the stories directly, mm. the story becomes more important. The education becomes much more important because the opportunity for Holocaust denial, for nobody to counter back and say, I was there, yeah. increases. And so the work of March of the Living, and not just March of the Living, other Holocaust yeah. uh, journeys that take place and other holocaust education programs that take place and and you've mentioned a couple that are really excellent and the museum in nottingham and places like yes that, you know are yes, doing sure. amazing work and i think amazing work i think absolutely the, the role of march for living and what we do to make sure that people keep going that people not only um are able to listen to the testimony, even if it's at second-hand base, but standing in that barrack in Auschwitz, standing in the, in the ghetto in Warsaw or in Woj, and hearing those stories and seeing for themselves that these places are real become mm. more important. Because yeah. honestly, the one thing we can't do is have it just put at the back of a history book and forgotten about. That's true. We cannot have it put at the back of a history book and forgotten about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your work and inspiration. We truly value you and you have changed hundreds and hundreds of people's lives and certainly the face of Anglo Jewry. Thank you. Laura, thank you very much. I'm truly honoured and uh, I shall carry on doing what I do for as long as I can. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Bye.